from Universidad Nacional de Colombia, Medellín. And he's talking about singular chains, on the groups, and the confederations. So, thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank uh, Alejandra and the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak. And I also want to thank you for everyone who's listening for, for your attention. Uh, okay, so the title of my talk is Singular Chains in Lead Groups and the Cartan Relations. So this is a talk on, uh, on lead theory and, and, and topology. That's, that's what I want to talk about. Let me show you what the outline of the talk is. Uh, it's roughly divided in three parts. So the, the first part, I will uh, discuss sort of the main ingredients of what I want to talk about, which are ch singular chains and lead groups and, and the Cartan relations, which arise in topology. Uh, the second part of the talk will be about the relationship between the first part and the churn bay theory for characteristic classes. And the third part of the talk is going to be about uh, the theory of local systems on classifying spaces and how they relate to the first two parts. So that's the plan. I also want to say that if someone has a question, please feel free to ask. I would uh, very much appreciate any comments or suggestions or questions. So please interrupt me if you want to. Okay, so let me start. So. Uh, We'll fix for the whole talk a simply connected Lie group. And this Lie group has a Lie algebra frac G that's fixed for the whole discussion. And we will consider the space of singular chains on this Lie group G. So this is the vector space generated by smooth simplices on G and we'll denote it by CG. Now, this space uh, has an algebraic structure. The structure it has is the structure of a differential graded Hopf algebra. And this, um, let me remind you for those who are not familiar with um, uh, the fact that it's a Hopf algebra, it means that it has two pieces of structure because it's an algebra, it has a product. And because it is a co-algebra, it has a co-product. And these two structures are related it's in some very specific way. Uh, they satisfy this identity. This identity which uh, sort of relates the product and the co-product. This is uh, the Hopf identity relation. So a uh, Hopf algebra is something that is an algebra and it's also a co-algebra and the product and the co-product are related by this identity. So what I'm saying is that this space of singular change on a Lie group has a structure of a Hopf algebra. Now, uh, let me remind you that the fact that it is a co-algebra is not dependent on G being a group. I mean, singular chains form a co-algebra for an arbitrary topological space, the product in, on singular cha change come for, comes from multiplication in the group. So the product in this algebra is defined using the Eilenberg silver map together with the multiplication that you have on a group. So those two pieces of structure uh, give you a product and a co-product and together they form a whole fault. So the island versus silver map is something that's defined combinatorially. It's something that depends simply on the combinatorics of simplices. And here is the formula, which if you haven't seen, it's not important to remember for the purposes of this talk. Better than the formula is the picture. I mean, the island versus silver map simply comes from the fact that you can embed the product of two simplices into a simplex of, sorry, you, yeah, you can embed the product of two simplices um, inside a simplex of higher dimension. So this is the geometry or sort of the combinatorics that comes into defining the Allen receiver map. But as I said before, if you haven't seen them, it doesn't really matter uh, at the level of these formulas what it is. It's just the fact that the product, the multiplication map on the group induces uh, a product on the algebra of singular chains. 
So now I want to uh, describe the relationship between the group ring and the algebra of singular chains. So um, let me show you what I mean by this. Um, so if you had a group, right? So, so if G is sort of an arbitrary discrete group, then of course, the representations of G are the same as modules over the group ring, let's say over R, say for a discrete group. Uh, now, this space of the group ring, in case your group has a topology, well, as we mentioned before, the algebra of singular chains is a differential graded algebra, differential graded Hopf algebra, and in degree zero, in degree zero, well, it, it is a subalgebra, and this subalgebra is, well, the group ring of G. So I'm simply saying that this uh, algebra of singular chain should be thought of as an extension of the of the group ring, an extension for which the degree zero part is precisely the group ring, but it has components of higher dimensions. So this algebra of singular change one can think of as an extension, a more topological version of the group ring of a topological group. Now, uh, given this um, relation here, that the representations of the group are the same as modules over um, the group ring, one can ask the same question about modules over the algebra of singular chains. So the question, the first question I want to address is, well, you know, representations of a group can be described infinitesimally in terms of representations of a Lie algebra. And the question I want to address is, well, how do you describe infinitesimally, not the modules over the group ring, but the modules over the whole algebra of singular chains? So this talk is about how you do Lie theory, how, how you do infinitesimal version of not modules over represent over over the group ring which are representations of the Lie algebra but modules over the algebra of singular chains the goal is to describe those modules infinitesimal that's the first question i want to ask okay so let me tell you how how this can be answered so uh, this can be answered in terms of uh, relations that arise in topology so these are the cartan relations so let me remind you that we have G is the Lie algebra of our Lie group. And given this Lie algebra G, one can form a different differential graded Lie algebra, which I will denote by TG. TG is a differential graded Lie algebra, which is sort of functorially associated to G. And it's very simple. It is a Lie algebra a graded Lie algebra that has components only in dimension zero and dimension minus one. And it satisfies these relations, which are called the Cartan relations. I mean, most of you probably recognize these are simply the relations that are satisfied uh, between the contractions and the Lie derivatives um, on a manifold. So if you have any manifold, then you have an algebra of vector fields. And these vector fields act on differential forms in two different ways. They act by contractions and by Lie derivatives. And the contractions and the Lie derivatives are related. They satisfy some identities. These identities are called the Cartan relations. So this Lie algebra TG that I'm introducing here is simply the algebra that's universal for the Cartan relations. In the sense that having an action of the Lie algebra TG is the same thing as having um, uh, the, 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 uh, satisfying the relations that are satisfied by Lie derivatives and contractions. So this is the universal, this TG is the universal differential graded Lie algebra for the Cartan relations. Okay, the point is that um, here's what I already mentioned that if G acts on a manifold then uh, the Lie algebra uh, of G acts on differential forms, but you have more. You have that not only G acts, but the whole TG acts because you have not only Lie derivatives, but you also have contractions. 
You have the lead derivatives here, but you'll have the contractions, and they are related. And the way in which they are related are the Cartan relations that I wrote before. So it's just universal for this for these identities. Okay, the first theorem I want to mention is that the, the question I posed before about describing infinitesimally the modules over the algebra of singular chains can be answered by this the algebra TG. So there is an integration functor that takes a representation of the algebra TG and produces for you a module over the algebra of singular chains. And this is an equivalence of categories. So what this says is that uh, it is possible to describe infinitesimally the modules over the algebra of singular chains by studying representations of this the algebra t, of this differential graded the algebra TG. This is, of course, an extension of the usual correspondence between representations of the Lie group and representations of the Lie algebra, right? So this, this, both of these categories, they contain the representations of, of the Lie algebra and the Lie group, and this functor is an extension of the usual correspondence between representations of the Lie group and representations of the Lie algebra. Uh, this is the first theorem I want to mention. Uh, I should tell you how the proof works, and uh, and that's um, that I can do. It is a very explicit construction that I will explain now. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, so then I'll so I have a question. Sorry? I have a question. So could you go back a few slides when you talk about the relationship between um, the what's that called uh, the group ring and the singular chains so there you view this g as a discrete group right so that, that's a good point so when i said um so if you if, if the lead group has a topology right then then i said that uh, modules over the group ring are the same thing as representations of the group but that's only true if i restrict to certain kind of modules over the group ring. I'm, I'm considering always smooth representation, say. And so if I, if I want to be completely precise, I need to say that these are modules over the group ring, which are sufficiently smooth if you want to recover the representations of the group. And the same should happen in this theorem. So when I say modules over CG, I'm sort of uh, implicitly assuming that, that the modules are sufficiently smooth in a way that, that has to be specified. But yeah. I'm, Sort of omitting some details uh, to be completely precise one should say that uh, all representations and our modules are supposed to be smooth so that you can really do the theory yeah you're, you're right that's a good point thank you okay thanks i hope that was uh, i hope that addresses your question yes thanks okay thank you all right so let me tell you how the proof works because it's very explicit. So uh, I'm, I'm telling you that there's an equivalence of categories. So in some way I need to produce, given a representation of the Lie algebra TG, I should be able to produce a modules over the algebra of singular chains. So I should be able to uh, produce an action of the whole space of singular chains on G on some vector space. So each singular space, sorry, each singular chain on the Lie group G should be able to act on a vector space, in a complex of vector spaces. And this is how it works. You start with a representation of the Lie algebra TG. So it means, I call it raw, so it's, a, it's just a map of Lie algebras from TG to the endomorphisms of some graded vector space. And out of this, I want to produce, I need to construct an equivariant differential form on the group. So this differential form is going to be a sum of homogeneous components. So alpha is going to be the sum of alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and so on. Where alpha i is an i form, is an i form on G with values in the endomorphisms of B. So this alpha is sort of a non-homogeneous differential form. It has homogeneous components, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and so on. It's alpha i, is in differential form of degree i in the Lie group. And this differential form of degree i in the group, or in this case of degree k in the group, 
is going to be defined as follows. When you evaluate these differential formatted identity and then evaluate in k vector fields, it's going to be the action of the action that you have, the, the representation row, evaluated on those vectors. That's how you evaluate the differential format, the identity. And because you want it to be equivariant, specifying its value at the identity determines the differential form. There's a unique differential form that satisfies these conditions. Notice that it doesn't look very anti-symmetric. Uh, so it doesn't look like it will define a differential form, but it does because precisely the, one of the Cartan relations guarantees that this is an anti-symmetric expression, skew-symmetric expression. Now this differential form, if you define it in this way in terms of rho, it turns out that its differential form satisfies a certain uh, sequence of differential equations. So uh, the first differential equation, it says that uh, the derivative of the alpha zero is the usual uh, Lie derivative. There is another relation that tells you how the differential form behaves with respect to multiplication. And there is another differential equation that tells you how the, the RAM operator acts on this differential form. So notice that this differential form is something you can explicitly produce given the representation row that you started with. So this representation row is exactly the, instruct, the, the, the data that you need to produce this differential form satisfying these differential equations on the Lie group. And then once you have the differential form alpha, you can do what you always do with differential forms, which is to integrate. So you take, you have a map I, and this map, it should produce a module um, uh, over the algebra of singular chain. So that means that given a singular chain, you should produce an endomorphism of the vector space. And the way you do it is by integration. So what you do is you take a differential form alpha, and the way in which you're going to produce the action of alpha on B is by integrating the pullback of alpha. This is the usual way. The only thing that you can do with differential forms. So given rho, you produce a sequence of differential forms. And by integrating those differential forms, you produce an action of the algebra of singular chains. Now, the differential equations that I wrote down for alpha are precisely uh, guarantee precisely that this map that I defined is uh, is a homomorphism of differential graded algebras, so that this this formula produces the structure of a module over the algebra of singular chains. So notice this is a completely explicit description. Even rho, you produce the differential forms, then integrate the differential forms, and that gives you the module. And the process is something that can be reversed because you can check that any differential form that, that gives you a module uh, will have to be constructed in this way. So that's how the equivalence of categories works. Uh, so this is the first thing I want to mention. Uh, uh, the, the, the conditions here that I had in, in the Lie group are simply that G is simply connected. Um, one can sort of uh, do a version of this if the group has a fundamental group, but it's not, it's not much more interesting. It would be just, uh, it's, it's, there, there would be no new ideas there. Uh, what is interesting is what happens when G is compact. So for the rest of the talk, once that we have this theorem, which is general for arbitrary simply connected Lie groups, what I want to explain next is what happens in the case where G is also uh, connected, sorry, also compact. So the rest of the talk will be about the relationship between this theorem that I just mentioned and the chain bay theory. And the chain bay theory, of course, works for compact groups. So this is uh, the second part of the talk. I want to remind you about chain bay theory for characteristic classes. So here are chain and bay and Simon bay. And uh, the Chern Bay theory uh, is a description of the characteristic classes of a space in terms of differential geometry and Lie theory. So let me just remind you briefly how Chern Bay theory works. 
Uh, so we start with the principal G bundle over X. And um, principal G bundles are classified by a classifying map. So uh, it's, this is uh, classified by a map F from X to BG. And this map F is well defined up to homotopy. So in cohomology, it defines uh, a map from the cohomology of BG to the cohomology of X. So there's a well-defined, once you have a principal G bundle, there is a well-defined map from the cohomology of BG uh, to the cohomology of X. Here, BG is, of course, the classifying space of G. Um, for those who are not very familiar with this, you can think that G is the unitary group. And in this case, um, the classifying space is an infinite dimensional grass manual. That's sort of the fundamental example of this construction. Um, so the Vey algebra is just the chevalier eilenberg uh, complex of the algebra TG. It's not usually presented in this way, but in, in the language that I'm using for this talk, that's an efficient way of saying what it is. And because TG is a contractible differential grade Lie algebra, then the Vey algebra is a contractible algebra, and it behaves as differential forms on the universal, on the, on, the, on the space of the universal bundle, on the total space of the bundle. And its basic part, the basic part of the Bay algebra turns out to be isomorphic to the invariant polynomials on the Lie algebra, and it's also isomorphic to the cohomology of the classifying space. So what this uh, computation of Chern and Bay is, is uh, the relationship between the Lie theory of the Lie algebra and the topological properties of the classifying space of the group. It's an infinitesimal description of the cohomology of the classifying space of the group. That's what Chern Bay theory does. And not only that, but it tells you that once you fix a connection on the principal G bundle, then that connection defines a map from the Bay algebra to differential forms in the bundle. And by restricting to the basic forms, you describe, you get, uh, algebra homomorphism from the invariant polynomials to the cohomology of X. And this, this is sort of a Lie theoretic or differential geometric description of the churn Bay homomorphism of the, classify, of the mapping used by the classifying map. So this is the, this is the churn Bay theory. So you, put, you, you, you have something defined in homotopy theoretic ways, and then you see that it has an analog in difference in geometry or in lead theory. That's, that's how it works. Now, I want to explain how uh, the construction I mentioned before about these representations of the algebra of singular chains are related to chain bay theory. That's pretty cool. So for this, I want to define two differential graded categories. So. For those uh, who are not familiar with these words, well, it simply means just like when you have an algebra, you can ask for the algebra to be a differential graded. So everything is graded and has differentials. A differential graded category is a category where the home spaces between two objects are differential graded objects also. So they're chain complexes. So differential graded category is simply a category where the home spaces are something that you can do homotopy with. In this case, they are chain complexes. That's what I mean by a DG category. So uh, what I want to do is I want to promote the theorem I told you about before to a theorem about differential graded categories. The first theorem I stated is a statement which is an equivalence of categories, uh, where I was considering these uh, categories of representations simply as categories. But I want to show you that in the case where G is compact, you can promote this result to make it a theorem about differential graded categories. And that's something that contains much more information. So this category of representations of the Lie algebra TG, which I have here in blue, it can be promoted to a category in yellow, uh, which is overlined, which is now a differential graded category. I won't go into the details, but I just want to say that you can promote the basic, just the 
the pair category to a different geographic category, which I will denote with overline. And the same is true on the other side. So the category of modules over the algebra of singular chain can also be enhanced, promoted to being a differential graded category. Both of these are ordinary categories in principle, and you can promote them to being differential graded categories. These are the ones that I'm denoting in yellow and they're uh, with an overline. So now the, the second theorem I want to mention is that in the compact case, uh, you can take the equivalence of categories and promote it to an infinity equivalence of differential graded categories. So if G is a compact simply connected Lie group with the algebra G, then uh, the following differential graded categories are A infinity equivalent. So now I put overlines on both sides. It means that the without overlines is the theorem that I had before for arbitrary Lie groups, but now when I am in the compact case when G is compact, then I have a much stronger result. It says that the equivalence can be promoted to an equivalence of differential graded categories. And I will try to explain what this means. But for now, it's just a stronger version of the previous result that holds in, um, in the compact case. So there is a word here, A infinity, uh, which maybe I should say something about. So A infinity means that um, all the morphisms that you have in this, in this context, they are allowed to be uh, only homotopic morphisms. So it means that equations do not necessarily hold strictly, but they hold up to higher coherent systems of higher homotopies. Uh, this is what the word A infinity means here. So this is the second theorem I I wanted to mention, and I want to, the proof is, is longer than the, than the other theorem that I mentioned, so I won't have time to tell you in all the detail, but I can tell you what the ingredients in the proof are. So let me try to do that. So the ingredients of the proof are, are the following. The first ingredient in the proof is uh, the theory of chance iterated integrals. So these are these are a construction that uh, it was introduced by quote side chain quote side and it's just um, it's just a sequence of integrals that arise very often in different parts of, of mathematics they arise in, in in solving explicitly differential equations for power transport they arise in uh, representation theory and they arise in topology and they arise in the theory even in number theory in theory multiple zeta values so these are uh, these are just uh, sequences of integrals that arise often for different reasons the second part um, the second ingredient which enters in this proof is is Guggenheim's version of the RAM theorem so I will say something more in a moment about it, but the idea is that uh, the usual Deram theorem that I, that at least I learned when I was a student that you usually teach in your classes, uh, admits a, a stronger version that was provided by Guggenheim in the 70s. And I will say something about it in a moment. Uh, the other uh, construction is uh, about schulman stashiv algebra for, for the cohomology of classifying spaces. So this is a, a model different from the Chern Bay model. It's a different uh, way to uh, think about or compute homologies of classifying spaces. And uh, another ingredient that entered is, is the non commutative version of, of the Bay algebra. So the Chern Bay theory that I described before, um, the way it's usually presented, it's something about commutative algebras because differential forms are commutative. But um, Alex Evan Mindren can they introduce a non commutative version of Chern Bay theory? And it turns out that this non commutative uh, construction enters in the proof. These are the four main ingredients of the, of the proof that I, um, let me say a little bit more about them, but I won't have time to say much more. So let me show you a sketch of, of the proof, how it works. Um, first, uh, iterated integral. So as I said, this is uh, for the purposes of, of this construction, it's just a way to produce differential forms and mapping spaces. This is what uh, what the way in which they uh, enter in, in, in constructions in topology. 
but they, they arise, as I said before, in other parts of topology, in Lie theory, in, multi, in the theory of multiple theta values, and probably you have encountered them for other reasons as well. So let me, uh, I mentioned Guggenheim, this is Guggenheim, and he proved um, an A-infinity version of the Rams theorem. So let me tell you what this is. Uh, Guggenheim's uh, A-infinity, the Ram theorem, is the following statement, is that when you have, so let me tell you what this means. So the way uh, the, Ram, the Ram theorem is usually stated is that when you have differential forms, you can view them as co-chains by integration, and this map induces an isomorphism cohomology. That's the way the Ram theorem is usually presented. Now, there is something which is uh, strange about this statement presented that way, and it is the following. It is that the Rams map is not an algebra map because the, the map that takes a differential form and sees it, sits it uh, as a co-chain, it's not an algebra map, and it shouldn't be because it goes from something commutative to something non-commutative. So you shouldn't expect to have a, an algebra homomorphism given by integration, and you don't. However, this map, which is not an algebra homomorphism, induces uh, an isomorphism of algebras in the in cohomology. So you have something that at the chain level is not an algebra map, but at the cohomology level, it is an algebra map. So that's uh, unnatural. That's uh, sort of begs for an explanation. And the explanation that was provided by Guggenheim is that the reason it happens is because the usual, the RAM map, is just the first part of an A-infinity map. So you have an infinite sequence of higher order maps that make it, that make, that, that produce an infinity equivalence between these two algebras, right? So, so that's a much better explanation of why you have something that's not an algebra map uh, but at, co at cohomology level, it becomes an algebra map. Now, these higher order correction terms to the, the Rams theorem, they're provided by chance integrals. So this is the work of Guggenheim, it was proved in the 70s. So this is an infinity version of the Rams theorem, and this enters in the proof. The bot Schulman algebra, these are both in, in Stash, if I couldn't find a picture of Schulman. So the bot Schulman algebra are just, it's just a, a uh, differential graded algebra, I have a picture of it here that can be used to, to compute to compute the cohomology of classifying space. It can be sort of constructed uh, combinatorially and it comes from a double complex and it's one of the ingredients of the proof. Um, in proving the theorem that I mentioned before, one of the intermediate spaces, uh, so in, in intermediate steps that one has to, uh, to go through is, to prove a version of the infinity Ram theorem for classifying spaces. So Guggenheim's theorem is just a theorem about manifolds, but you can try to do it for classifying spaces. Classifying spaces are infinite dimensional, well, manifolds if you want, but they're not manifolds in the, in the standard sense. So you require some work in proving um, an infinity version of the Ram theorem for classifying spaces as well. And this is something we did with Alexander Quintero, oh, sorry, I. It was in the first slide, but maybe I should have mentioned it explicitly that uh, this talk is based in joint work with Alexander Quintero, who's my colleague here. Uh, I should have mentioned that earlier, sorry. Anyway, so one of the intermediate steps uh, in the proof is this infinity version of classify, for classify, of the Rams theorem for classifying spaces, uh, which is based on, on Guggenheim's uh, construction. So we proved an infinity version for for classifying spaces as well. And this infinity version, what it relates is uh, this, this bot Schulman model for the cohomology of the classifying space with the Hochschild, Hochschild cohomology of the algebra of singular chains of G. So what we provide, uh, produced is an explicit A infinity uh, equivalence between the bot Schulman algebra that I mentioned before and the algebra of Hochschild cochains in the algebra of singular chains of G you can produce an explicit infinity map between these two algebras, and this is an equivalence. Uh, this is based on, 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 on Guggenheim's construction. And the other uh, 
sort of key step in the proof is what I mentioned earlier, which is a non commutative version of the Chen Wei theory. And the, re and the reason that it enters, I, I want to tell you, is why do you need something non commutative? You see, because when you're doing, when you're doing sort of ordinary uh, differential geometry, your you're, uh, algebras are algebras of differential forms and they are commutative. But when you go to infinite dimensions, the models that you have for the cohomology of spaces, they're, for instance, here, they're the Bot Schulman algebra or they're the Hochschild co chains. And these are non commutative algebras. And that's the reason that if you want uh, to use the Chen Wei theory, you need to have a non commutative version of it. So, yeah, so we have that. It's, it was uh, introduced by uh, Alexei van Meinrenken. And um, we use it in the construction. It's a non commutative version of the Wei algebra. Um, this non commuted version of Wei algebra was introduced by Alexeva Mein Renkin, as I said before, uh, for different purposes. The, they used it for applications in Lie theory and in Chern Wei theory. Uh, I guess the, one of the more interesting applications they found is a proof of, of the, the flow isomorphism uh, in the case of quadratic Lie algebra. So I think so the, the main application they, they use this non commutative. Uh, Bay algebra four is about a well the flow the, the flow isomorphism in Lie theory. Um, it's usually proved by transcendental methods. Uh, you need some complicated integrals or some uh, Greenfield associators. But in the case of quadratic Lie algebras, they found a much easier proof, and this proof uses the non-commutative Bay algebra. That was, I think, their original motivation. Anyway, so now I want to tell you about the theory of local systems. Uh, so local systems, um, I guess, uh, um, many of you will have encountered their local systems for cohomology theories, and they can be um, described in different ways from the point of view of geometry. If you're a differential geometer, you can think that they're flat connections. If you are more into representation theory, you can think that they're representations of, of, of some sort of fundamental groupoid. And if you're more interested in homotopy theory, you can think that these are modules over the algebra of uh, singular chains on the base loop space of your space. So this, these are uh, structures that are usually known as higher local systems. And the reason they're higher is because everything here is graded. And if you restrict to non-graded things, you get recovered the usual, well, the usual notion of local systems that, uh, that you encounter in the courses in topology, which are, uh, well, locally constant sheaves or flat vector bundles or representations of the fundamental groupoid. But these are sort of allow for higher dimensions. That's what the word uh, hires, higher means here. All right. so. There's sort of there's a theory, a well-developed theory of higher local systems, and um, let me say something about them. Uh, there is a technicality here when I when I said that you can consider modules over the algebra singular chain. This is not exactly true because the base loop space is not a group because Composition of paths is not an associative structure. So in this picture, you see that if you compose paths into different ways, uh, you don't get the same answer because you get different parameterizations. So the base loop space is not a group, but it wants to be a group. And um, there is a way to fix it. And this way to fix it is to remember the length of a path. So if you replace the base loop space on a space by what's called the Moore loop space, what it does is it remembers the length of a path. And then if you put this extra data, then you can make a space which is homotopy equivalent to the, to the base loop space, but it now has a strictly associative structure. So that's a way in which you can, in which you can think of uh, higher local systems as modules over the algebra of 
singular chains on the Moore loop space, which is now uh, genuinely uh, a topological monoid. So the Moore loop space uh, is a topological monoid, and so singular chains on it are a Hopf algebra. Modules over this Hopf algebra are, uh, you can think of them as high local systems on a space. Now, the, 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 there is a, a theorem which usually goes by the name of Freeman Hilbert correspondence that tells you that, well, essentially that you can identify flat connections with representations of the fundamental group. In, there's sort of all sorts of versions of this theorem, but essentially it's just the Lie theory which tells you how uh, representations of a fundamental group uh, can be described infinitesimally. It goes by the higher by the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence, and there is a higher version of the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence in this setting, and it says that all the possible notions of local systems that I mentioned before they produce um, equivalent or quasi-equivalent differential graded categories. So it means that there is a robust theory of higher local systems, and they satisfy the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence that one would expect. Uh, this, this is uh, work, the theorem that I have here in blue is, is sort of a collection of results by several people. Uh, there's uh, Block and Smith, there is uh, Julian Holstein, the, I did some work with Florian Chetz. These sort of different pieces are in different places, but essentially uh, what happens at the end is that uh, all the possible versions of higher local systems, uh, they are equivalent. So it's sort of a robust generalization of the, of the classical result. And so because all these possibilities are equivalent, then I'll just denote log x by any of these differential graded categories, which are all equivalent. Um, so the last theorem I want to mention is that these categories uh, of representations, so again, so if G is a compact and simply connected Lie group, then the following categories are infinity equivalent. And these are these three categories. So the category of representations of PG, the category of modules over the algebra of singular chains, and also the category of local systems on the classifying space. So all of these categories are infinity equivalent. So it means that the first theorem that I told you about, um, which is sort of can be thought of as simply a piece of Lie theory, you describe infinitesimally the modules. It can also be thought of as a categorified version of the, of the Chern Bay theory, where you computing infinitesimally some topological invariant of the classifying space PG. In this case, this topological invariant is a category of local systems over PG. Um, yeah, so, so this, these three categories are equivalent for representations of TG, the categories of modules over singular chains and the category of local systems on the classifying space. These are all equivalent differential graded categories. Uh, I want to finish um, with a couple of examples to show you how, how this theorem uh, sort of relates to, to the churn Bay theory, right? So I want to show you two examples to get a feeling for what this means. So the first example is just um, what happens if you apply these equivalents of categories to the trivial representation, right? So, so I'm, I'm stating that there is um, here an equivalence of categories, but these categories, well, they are categories of modules, in particular, you have a trivial module. So you can ask, well, what happens if I apply these equivalents of categories to the trivial module? So, we, we know that the local system of, of BG can be, is equivalent to representations of TG. So in particular, this, this equivalent sends the trivial representation to the trivial representation. So, well, it means that the endomorphisms of the trivial representation in one category needs to be equivalent to the endomorphisms of the trivial representation in the other category. And it also has to be equivalent to the cohomology of the local of the space BG with trivial coefficients with trivial local system, right? So it means that it gives you the cohomology of BG as the endomorphisms of the trivial module in either of these two categories. And if you unravel what this 
uh, spaces of endomorphisms are, you just recover chain bay uh, construction, uh, chain bay computation of the cohomology of BG. So in particular, when you apply uh, this equivalence of categories to a trivial module, what you see is that, well, when you compute the cohomology of BG with trivial coefficients, you recover uh, chain base uh, computation that you get invariant polynomials and the Lie algebra. That's for the trivial module. But there are other modules which are also interesting. So let me show you a different example. Second example I want to mention is the free loop space of the classifying space. So, well, if you have any space, you have a loop space vibration, which takes the free loop space on that space and evaluates it at, at, at one, right? So you have a free loop space vibration. So it's a map from the free loop space of BG to BG. And this vibration has a gauss manin connection. This gauss manin connection is a local system on BG. And it turns out that you can identify, if you believe that this uh, local system on BG can, well, can be described as a module over TG, then you can sort of identify it as the chevalet Eilenberg complex of, of TG. And um, this implies that, well, the cohomology of the total space of the vibration should be the same thing as the cohomology uh, of the base with coefficients in the gauss manin connection. And if you unravel what this means, you get that the cohomology of the loop space of BG is the mapping space from the trivial module to this module in this category, or the mapping space from the trivial module to this module in the category of REP of TG. Both of these things are naturally isomorphic once you compute them to the equivariant cohomology of G uh, acting on itself by conjugation. And so what you recover is a well-known fact that the cohomology of the loop space is, sorry, the cohomology of the loop space of the classifying space is isomorphic to the cohomology, uh, the equivariant cohomology of G acting on itself by conjugation. So when you apply the equivalence of categories that I mentioned before to this path space vibration, what you recover is the computation of the equivariant cohomology of G acting on itself by conjugation as the cohomology of the free loop space of the classifying space. So, so, so you recover sort of these uh, topological computations as, as a consequence of the equivalence of categories. Um, I think this is all I wanted to say. I, I thank you all for your attention. Thanks. Thank you so much, Camilo. So are there any questions? Now you can unmute your microphones and ask, or you can write on. So let me uh, stop sharing and maybe I'll, in case there are questions in the, sure. in the chat. Anyone would like to ask a question? Um. Okay, so I asked one, but this is a bit far from work. <laughs> So uh, we have Riemann Hilbert correspondence, uh, the holomorphic one, and uh, uh, and you have uh, the uh, flat vector bundles with local local constant shifts. And what we do is like we have an, an algebraic version of it, uh, like with T modules, holonomic T modules, and Herbert shifts. And I don't know if there is a kind of an algebraic version of of uh, the high Riemann correspondence, of if it makes sense. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. So, um, so if you have some sort of extra structure, something uh, holomorphic, is that what you mean? So this is sort of a. So I think there are sort of all sorts of kinds of Riemann-Hilbert correspondences. This is just one more of them, and this is sort of the more, in a, in a way, the more flexible one, the more topological. So it tells you that. Instead of thinking about representations of just the fundamental group, you want to think of um, 
of, of local systems where you have holonomies not, not only for one dimensional things, but you have holonomies for simplices of all dimensions. Mm -hmm. And, the, and the, the theorem is that also those, just like the ordinary ones you can describe by flat connections, um, these higher dimensional ones you can also describe different geometrically by, by some sort of flat super connections. That's, that's the way, that's the way it, it, it works. And it can be thought of as some sort of version of Lie theory also. Now, whether you can combine the two, the two ideas and make some sort of a higher dimensional version in presence of more, say, holomorphic or algebraic structure, uh, I don't know the answer. I just know the answer to that. And when I have briefly thought about it, and the first place where I got stuck is that, well, if, you're, if you want to do holomorphic things, well, I don't know how you get odd, odd simplices. So here in this, in this construction, you have simplices of all, of, all, of all dimensions, and it's important that you have simplices of all, of all dimensions, but, um, but in the holomorphic case, well, you only have even dimensions. So, so that, that was the first place where I got stuck, but I didn't, I, I just don't know the answer. Okay. Thank you so much. Any other questions? So we thank Camilo again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.